original version. Thank you, child. Stepping in for me. Second Kings 5 and 1. Second Kings 5 and 1. You have to say amen. Amen. You don't have to say not yet. Not yet. Second Kings, the fifth chapter. I'm going to begin reading at the first verses on the screens. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because y'all know what? I started in the wrong place. Y'all can hear me. Jump to the 18th verse for me. Yes, Lord. I threw my technician off. Second Kings 5, 18. It reads this way. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive me, forgive your servant for this. I want to start a series today called Mentality. Mentality. Messages for men. Mentality. Today I want to start the series off with this subject. Men of integrity. Go ahead. Men of integrity. Go ahead. Find a man in this place and ask him, are you a man of integrity? May have your seats in the house. It was Colin Kaepernick who said, There are bodies in the streets, and cops are getting paid leave and getting away with murder. I'm not looking for approval. I have to stand up for people that are oppressed. If they take away football, my endorsements for me, I know that I stood up for what is right. When Colin Kaepernick took a knee, his outward position was only a reflection of his inward conviction. In every man, there is a battle. An inward desire, because I believe I got brothers in here that got good hearts, that all of us have this inward desire to have our outward position to match our inward conviction. To live out what we believe. This is living honestly. This is living with integrity. Being a Christian automatically makes us adopt a belief system that is opposite of the world system. And because of that, our integrity, because of that, we are constantly under attack to stand integral. The world, the flesh, and the devil have teamed up against us, my brother, Amen. to cause our outward position to be totally opposite of our inward conviction. All right. Amen. All right. Come on, man. Even though we are convinced, y'all, y'all, y'all say, say convicted. convicted. Did y'all know that convicted is only a derivative of the word convinced? It just means to be convinced that you are a sinner or convinced that God is God. And uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us or convinces us. And so does God's word convict us or convinces us. And even though that we are convinced that adultery is wrong. The devil tempts married men Amen. to step outside their marriage all the time. Amen. Even though we are convinced that we should not be looking at pornography, the world, the flesh, and the devil has made it so easy that pornography is, is so accessible that it's accessible as the push of a button. It's always accessible everywhere you go. 
The world, the flesh, and the devil have teamed up to against fathers who want to be that. They want to be good fathers, but there are so many things that come against our time. And uh, somebody said, all I need to do is spend quality time with my children, but the devil is alive because you don't only need quality time with your children, but you need quantity time with your children. Amen. And, and, and everything comes against us to stop us from spending that quality and quantity time with our children. I don't care if your children live in the house with you. So many things come against you, your job and your career and things you have to do. It becomes a challenge to do both quality and quantity. The world, the flesh, and the devil are working against us to make our inward conviction because we know our children need us. We don't have to be convinced of that. Uh, but our inward conviction is not lining up with our outward position. We want to be husbands, the men in here that have wives. We, we try to figure out how uh, God made uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And we're trying to figure out these beautiful creatures that live with us, but our minds cannot wrap around how their minds wrap around. Amen. And the Bible said that we ought to deal with them with understanding, and that's a difficult thing for a Man, I know I'm not going to be no amen for the woman right here, but I thought I might have a, three, a few brothers that's buried in here that would say amen. I'm amen. struggling to understand. Amen. amen. Yeah, we, we struggle with being faithful to our calling. Yeah. We struggle with being faithful to our calling because I thank God for Pastor Bobo who said, and I just will always ride with me because many of you brothers are called to ministry and maybe not walking in the place that you need to be walking in. And we are, we've shown up, need to be walking as leaders in God's church because you've been called out as a man of God. Amen. I thank God for Pastor Bobo who said this one statement that all of the brothers need to, know, need to hear because a lot of times we'll get so discouraged when we're trying to walk in our ministry. It seems like so many things are coming against us. We're trying to be a stand-up brother at church and be an example at church uh, in the church body and in the community of Christ. We have so many things coming against us and a lot of times we get discouraged. I thank God for Pastor Bubba who said sometimes you got to beat off discouragement like they tried to steal your wallet. Oh my. That's right. Yeah, because discouragement will come upon you, but you got to be extra vigilant to push it off of you. We fight so many things, and we want to be a man of integrity. And then their team, the world, the flesh, and the devil, desire to present us as hypocritical. Right, right. But the devil is a lie. Amen. I came today to speak into the lives of every man that's under the sound of my voice and call you a man of integrity. You might not be living it out right now. You might not think I'm talking to you, but I'll speak it over your life. Whatever is causing the causing the blockage from you living out what you believe, I call you a man of integrity. I pray that you are receiving it on today. And I wish I had some women that would shout back at me because if there ain't nobody else that needs a man of integrity around you, in our text today that we see a man with an issue of integrity. Unlike Colin Kaepernick, he failed to allow his inward conviction to affect his outward position. This man in the text is named. I'm going to need y'all to go with me because we're going to have to look at our Bible just for a minute. So stay with me. Uh, somebody say name. N double A M A N. Naaman had been convicted or convinced that he had been worshiping the wrong God and that the God of Israel was the only true God. You find his story in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Let me catch you up in the middle of the movie because I read the 18th verse and you don't even know what that's about. So let me catch you up in the middle of the movie. You know how sometimes you be at home and, you, and your spouse, uh, you be watching something and your spouse come in, they're trying to watch it with you. You got to pause that Netflix to catch her up and say, okay, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. Now we can start looking at where we at right now. 
now. I want to do that same thing for everybody in here. I want to catch you up in the middle of the movie. So let's look at this first verse. Amen. Second Kings, the fifth chapter, the first verse, it says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aaron. This is a key verse, y'all. He was a, a valiant soldier. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He was a commander, not in Israel's army. Check that out. He's a commander in Aaron's army. Amen. And he is a valiant soldier and he has leprosy. Y'all know what leprosy is. It is a skin disease. If you look at contemporary versions of the Bible, you have to look at the book of Leviticus. It tells you what to do about leprosy, but it doesn't say leprosy. It says infectious skin disease. Ooh, if, the, if nothing else sounds nasty, amen. Leprosy sounds all right, but then when you say infectious skin disease, that sounds like something you want to stay away from. Amen. And so he was not in Israel. There were rules for people that had leprosy in Israel, but he wasn't in Israel. He was, he was in Aram, and because he was in Aram, he was still allowed to be a commander. He was still allowed to be in the army. He was still allowed to grow as a as somebody in the army and take position. And so he's in this position. He's a valiant soldier, but he has leprosy. At a previous conflict with Israel, because Aaron was also, was oftentimes uh, Israel's enemy. Aaron was oftentimes. Israel's enemy at a previous conflict, Naaman took a young girl from Israel to be the maid servant for his wife. Amen. I wish I could do that. I wish I could get somebody that could come into our house to help my wife. Amen. Take care of the house. Do the girl's hair to clean up. Amen. 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 I didn't have no sister to talk back to me like right that. I wish I'm, I'm trying to get to the place where I can hire Mary Maid. Amen. And so he gets this girl. He said, you know what? I'm going to get this girl. I'm going to take her home. And she's going to take care of my wife. She's going to be my wife's maid servant. When this young woman from Israel, this young girl, saw that Naaman had leprosy, this is something to be said about this young girl, because when she saw that Naaman had leprosy, what she did is told her, uh, told her mistress, that's what they call the wife, they, she told her mistress, hey, I see that your husband has leprosy. Well, there is a prophet in Israel that if she just went back to him, she, he can be healed of his leprosy. That's something to be said, because she was taken captive and she really was a slave but somehow in her heart it still was her to look after uh, Naaman that's something to be said that's not my that's not my ministry today that's not my sermon on today but she told them about a prophet in Samaria uh, which was a part of Israel at this time amen she said there's a prophet in Samaria and his name is Elijah Skipping ahead, Naaman makes arrangements to get to the prophet. If somebody's going to heal me from my infectious skin disease, I'm going to hurry up. I'm going to make arrangements to get over there to Samaria so I can meet the prophet. And the great army commander, y'all got to go back and read this. This is your homework. Uh, uh, second, second Kings, the fifth chapter. I pray that you would read that uh, during the week and catch up on the story and how it went down because I know y'all want to see how how Naaman rolled up to Elijah's house. He rolled up to Elijah's house, this great army commander. Y'all know how it goes. He came in his motorcade of black SUVs. Amen. <laughs> he was somewhere in the middle of them and as he pulled up in his motorcade of black SUVs, Elijah doesn't even come out the house, but he said, Sends a messenger and tells Naaman that he doesn't even have to come out the house. And this is the message. Amen. We are getting close to the circumference of our text in 2 Kings, the 5th chapter, the 10th verse. It's on the screen. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. Yeah, you're, 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 you will be cleansed. Look what happens next at the 11th verse. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would at least come outside, slap some oil on me, pronounce. Hey, Amen. Let me read this text. Amen. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Amen. No, is it? 
Yeah, the, the 12th verse. Isn't there a place like, you know, Lake Michigan? You know, Lake Michigan? Can I go dip, can I go dip in Lake Michigan? Or can I go at least go to Creve Coeur Lake and dip <laughs> in Creve Coeur Lake? But you want me to go dip in the Mississippi? Look, look at that's what he says. He said, are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned, amen, he got back into his motorcade and they pulled off, amen, and named his servant. And the 13th verse went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he turned that motorcade around, went down and dipped himself seven times in the Mississippi, seven times in the Jordan as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became like that of a young boy. He had smooth, baby-like skin. He was restored and the 15th verse says, then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Mm, amen. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Now he is convicted, y'all. He is convinced that there is no other God in Israel. There is no other God except the God in Israel. Now, you have to go back to the story. Let's skip ahead to the circumference of our text. At the eight, that, let's look at the 16th verse. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let your servant be given as much earth. Give me some dirt from Israel that I can take back as much as my mules can carry. I'm going to take it back and we're going to make offerings and sacrifices from the dirt and the land of Israel. I will no longer make sacrifices to any other God. But, 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 you know, the God of Israel is the real God. Amen. I'm going to make sacrifices to him and no other God, but, 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 may the Lord forgive me of this one thing. May the Lord forgive your servant of this one thing. When my master entered the temple to bow down to Ramon, what a God name, amen, that's the name of his God, Ramon. If he bows down to Ramon and he's leaning on my arm, and I bow down also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. What leaps out of the text at me is I see an improper response to conviction. I see an improper response to conviction. Naaman responds to his conviction. Y'all heard me say this, uh, Unfellow Love Christian Church. Uh, there's a term that we've heard before it comes from a pit from the pulpit called uh, premeditated repentance. <laughs> Y'all know what premeditated repentance is. really not repentance because repentance means really just to turn around. Y'all ask the Lord for forgiveness before you do something. Y'all ever been in that position? You was about to do something and you knew it was wrong and so you tried to ask for forgiveness before you did it. Premeditated uh, confession. He literally asked God for an advance on his forgiveness. Amen. I, I believe we do that sometimes. We ask God for an advance on his forgiveness. He was convicted. He knew he was wrong, but yet he wanted God to forgive him before he even did. That's an improper response to conviction. Now, watch this. I like this man because he reveals to us that men do get convicted. Yeah, it's not like we don't really know what's going on. Amen. Uh, as a matter of fact, men feel conviction, but men, if you just look at them for a minute, maybe the women can look into the lives of your men and realize this is what happens with us. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but it's at least three things that we do uh, when we are convicted. Either we grow from it, amen, or we try to justify what we're doing, go ahead, go ahead. or we ruin. Amen. It's not that we don't know that we are wrong. Yeah, we know we are wrong. Yeah, everybody got blind spots, right? We got blind spots, but then there's some clear spots that we got. There's some stuff that we straight up know that we're not supposed to be doing that we should be doing or some stuff that we're co 
omitting and there are some stuff that we're omitting many times, we know there's times that we can be better fathers and better husbands and better sons and better brothers and better Christians. We can be better in all of those things, but many times we don't do it. It's because we are either justifying it or we are running from it. The scripture says in James that this is a good illustration that we should be not only hearers of his word, but we should be doers of his word. James describes it like this. He says if you are a hearer and not a doer, it's like a man that looks into a mirror and then after he looks in the mirror and walks away, he forgets what he looks like. I like that illustration because the word is a mirror unto our life. When we look at the word of God and we are convinced of the way that we look, we are convinced of the sin that's in our life, we are convinced of the calling that God has on us. If we are hearers only and not doers, we walk away from that mirror and forget what we look like. This is the way, reason why we have to stay in the word of God. This is my illustration. Y'all heard this before, so you're going to have to endure it again. When you look into that mirror of the word, amen, it's just like this. When you look at that word, you look in that mirror, and you're a hearer only, it's like you look in that mirror and you see a big old booger in your nose. You look in that mirror, you see a big old booger, I mean a nasty one. It's, the color is green. Oh. Slimy, thank you. Amen. <laughs> it's a big old nasty booger. You see that big old nasty booger, and then you walk away and forget the big old nasty boogers in your nose. Oh. That's what it's like to be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. When God showed you yourself and he showed you that booger in your nose, it wasn't to shame you. Amen. Yeah. It was not to shame you, my brother. When God convicts us, it's not to shame us. But this is the devil's work. I hope a brother hears me in here on today that when you are convicted of the word, you should not feel guilty. There's a difference between conviction and guilt. Conviction makes you do better. Guilt makes you stay in the same place and just a ball run. Yes. Amen. And that's, that, that's the aim of the enemy, my brother, to keep you down, to make you run instead of change. Many fathers don't try to go see their children because after time lapses, they begin to feel so much shame and they begin to feel so much guilt that they just continue to run. Shame will make you abuse substances just so you won't have to face yourself. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get into some alcohol and you'll, you'll get into some marijuana just because you don't have, want to face yourself and you'll get into some pornography just so you don't have to face yourself. Anything that takes away our shame and numbs the pain because real talk, there's some brothers in here that feel shame and really that shame is pain to you and you can't resolve it because you're too shame to go try to resolve it. Can I suggest to you that that is the work of the devil to keep you running in circles and not facing the demons that's in your life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, when, when men are shamed, they run to places where they will be celebrated. Women, y'all need to hear that on today. I'm talking about men. The, the name of this series is Mentality. This is the way that we think. Uh, right or wrong, this is what we think. Men will run to places where we are celebrated, y'all. This is why you will see a man leave a beautiful wife and go get married to an ugly woman because that ugly woman knew what to say to him and knew how to celebrate him. This is why men end up in strip clubs because the women look at them like they are wanted and they are needed. And all, and all they want, and you know all they want is your money and those dollars, but they look at you in a certain way and make you feel a certain way, make you feel celebrated. This, this my brother, is the trap of pornography. This is the trap of pornography because the way that the women look on there is like they're looking at you like they desire you. And truth be told, I'm, I know that this is a men's conference right here, so forgive me, ladies. But when we're sitting there and we're imagining this woman with us, it looks like she's looking at us and we are going to the places where we are celebrated. Come on, Pastor Jason. This is the allure of the mistress. Because the mistress will pay more attention to you than your wife. The mistress will compliment you. The mistress will tell, them, tell you that you something. She don't know what she's doing with you. She don't celebrate you. You are a good man. Men run to the places where they are celebrated. 
then what the devil will have us doing is justifying our behavior, which only perpetuates the behavior. To have us justifying our behavior, which only perpetuates the behavior. You know, the reason why I stepped out on my wife is because she wasn't paying attention to me. She wasn't giving me what I need. And the, when you go with those justifications, you just stay there right where you are. The reason why I have to keep going back to this pornography, okay, it's all adults in here. The reason why I have to keep going back to this pornography is because my wife isn't giving me what I need or, or I don't have enough self-control as a single brother and I got needs and I got to be fulfilled. This is the reason why I'm doing it. I just justify it. When you justify it, you perpetuate the behavior. This is where it gets bad because everybody sees the booger in your nose. Amen. 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 The people that are connected to you are the most affected because they see the booger in your nose and it's so obvious and you think you're walking around looking clean, but you're looking like a hypocrite because your inward position is not matching your outward position. When God convicts us, it is to give us a chance to grow, y'all. That's what the conviction is for. Many times, pinpointing the problem is equal to finding the solution. Many times, pinpointing the problem is equal to finding the solution. I'm trying to give you uh, so that you can pinpoint the problem so that you can come right to that solution. Many times, just pinpoint the problem. You have the solution right there the other day. Something simple, y'all. I was in the office and I was vacuuming and the vacuum wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. I was just rolling over stuff and it was just staying on the ground. And I said, something's wrong with this vacuum. And so I began to look all through the hoses of the vacuum to see was it clogged somewhere. And I didn't find a clog. Finally, I flipped it on the bottom side and I, I had to unscrew it actually to get to where I needed to get to. And so I did all of that. I didn't know if I had time enough to just dig all into this thing, but I needed the vacuum floor. So I, I got it, I turned it around, I took the thing off, and I found that there was a big old claw right in the middle of the vacuum on the bottom. Nothing was getting in to the vacuum. Here's, here's my point to you all. Men of integrity must respond properly to conviction. And so once I find the problem, Amen. It was a quick solution. All I had to do was take the claw out. That's right. Yeah. As I, I wonder what would happen to men if we quit ignoring the claw. Wow. That's hard, sir. That's hard. Good question. Good question. What, what would happen if we quit ignoring the claw? The claw is there. All we got to do is pull it out. Amen. I wonder what would happen if we quit ignoring what the Holy Spirit has convicted us of or convinced us of. What, what if we didn't ignore the Holy Spirit telling us to take the first step in our marriage? Yeah, what if, uh, if we pick up the phone when the Holy Spirit prompts us to call our kids or to go pick our kids up and spend some time with them? What would happen uh, if when we got tempted as brothers either to step out of our marriage or to mess with some pornography or make that booty call? What would happen if we, if we were convicted by the Holy Spirit and called up our accountability partner and say, bro, man, I'm, I'm feeling some type of way. I'm about to do some stuff I don't need to do. I need you to pray for me right here. And, and what would happen if we responded properly to conviction? You can do it, brother. You can respond properly to conviction. It's right there. You already know how to fix it. And God just didn't give you the solution without power. He has given you the Holy Spirit. I come to speak to every man in this place that don't feel like he can take the first step in his marriage that his wife is getting on his nerves so much. He's tired of taking the, the high road. But brother, you are the man of that house. You are the prophet of that house. You've got to take the high road. If Amen. you don't take the high road, who will take the high road? Amen. Amen. And you are not. You are not weaker for taking the high road, you are stronger for taking the high road. Because when you take the high road, you're beating off the world, and you're beating off the flesh, and you're beating off the devil. And the only thing that gives you power to beat off the world and beat off the flesh and beat off the devil is the Holy Ghost that's residing in you. And when you take a step in the direction of the Holy Spirit wants you to do, you'll see him work the supernatural. You'll be able to do some stuff you thought you weren't able to do. Not, not only do I see an improper response to conviction, I see y'all the trap of the comfort zone. The, the, the trap of the comfort zone. Hey, but you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm only going to worship God, but hey, hey. Amen. Listen, listen. 
When I go back home, I got a job. You know, I got position. I'm a commander in the army. Uh, but 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 you have to forgive me when I go back because I'm still gonna have to bow down to this other guy. Even though I believe he's the greatest God, even though I had this miracle happen to me where I got smooth baby skin now, even though I can see it everywhere I go, uh, I know he got, but, 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 but if I go back and I don't bow down, I'm going to lose my job. If I go back and I don't bow down, I'm going to lose my position. And I'm gonna miss those comforts of my position. You know, like I was rolling around in that motorcade of them black SUVs, that's not gonna happen no longer. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna lose my position. I see the trap of the comfort zone. His position is in jeopardy. He could not recognize the God of Israel when he got back home. This was a weird current thing. He's basically back at the Jordan. He's back at the Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. He had position and comforts that come with it. Y'all know manhood, let's talk brothers. Manhood, <laughs> we, we gauge levels of manhood. Right. I mean, after a while, after a while, there's just a certain car that you're not gonna drive. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was talking to my wife, she was talking about that new blazer that was out. And I said, that's nice, but that's a girl car. Amen. <laughs> there you go. Amen. Amen. Said, that's a girl car. That's not what it's, it's a car. No, I was like, no, that's a girl car. I said, I, I need the bigger one. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And that, when you get to a certain level, there's just a certain thing. Sometimes you just will not, you won't, you won't, you won't bow down. You won't drive this. Amen. You won't, you won't, you won't stay in certain places. I mean, there, there was a time when you used to stay at any hotel. Amen. Amen. But after you have reached a certain level of manhood, you're like, nah, I'm not staying there. I'm like, I'm not. Well, I ain't staying there. Yeah, there. There's certain clothes you won't wear. Amen. Some of y'all think y'all got a contract with Nike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't dare put on those shacks, amen. <laughs> and and, and those that would feel like you got a contract with Nike, you're not wearing no Reebok. You look at Reebok like, no, nah, all my stuff gotta be Nike, amen. And I know like, brother, listen, listen I, I can't wait, I can't wait till I get to this place because I'm tired of cutting my grass, y'all. I thought I would never get to that place, but I feel like you have really made it to manhood when somebody pull up to your house with some lawnmowers and hit that man and say, how you doing? Hallelujah! I said, well, when I get there, I have made it. <laughs> I want to be, be like my neighbors, just some older men in my, my neighbor. My, my next door neighbor is still cutting grass. Y'all saw on Facebook that he was cutting grass in a tornado. <laughs> But, but everybody else, everybody else got people pulling up, and I'm just like, man, I wish I can get some people to pull up. <laughs> I just can't justify it yet. <laughs> amen. I say, yeah, amen. Uh, plus, I got a 14 year old boy in my house. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right, right. But, but, but all of these comforts are wonderful when you get to places of, man, really. When we look back at Naaman, Naaman finally relinquishes his comforts. When he was at the Jordan, he said, I'm going to give this stuff up, even though I'm too good to dip in the Jordan. Amen. I need Lake Michigan. I need Creve Court Lake. But I'm going to go ahead and get in this Mississippi. He relinquishes his comforts. Now, I have, to, I have to say this about Naaman. that I was looking at Naaman, and we're looking at Naaman on today as somebody that you don't want to replicate, something that you don't want to do. But there's a place in here that we must celebrate Naaman because Naaman does something that's good, y'all. Uh, when he left off, when he said, I'm not getting into that Mississippi River, he got in his motorcade and motorcade was sped off, and he had some servants in there that said, Father, Father, if he asked you to do something great, would you wouldn't do that? He said, so why don't you just go and do this? 
And Naaman listened to his servants. The servants they called him fathers. He listened to his sons. Amen. And, and brothers, here's my point. This is not on the screen, but you got to receive this that every man needs a man he can listen to. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Every man need a man he can listen to. I'm going to tell you three men that you need in your life, brothers. You need a Paul, you need a Barnabas, and you need a Timothy. Wow. Timothy, somebody say Timothy. Timothy. Timothy had his father in the ministry named Paul. Timothy had a father in the ministry named Paul. Paul showed Timothy what he was supposed to do in ministry, gave him instruction, spent time with him. He fathered him in the ministry. Paul called Timothy his true son in the ministry. So Paul, uh, Timothy had a Paul. But watch this, y'all. Every, every Timothy needs a Paul, somebody you can look forward to, somebody you can listen to, somebody that can train you, something that you can be poured in. To, amen. Every every Timothy needs a Paul, but Paul needed a Barnabas. Paul had his friend Barnabas. This is somebody that was his peer, somebody that was in ministry with him. But Barnabas was one of those men that encouraged Paul all the time. Amen. You need somebody that's uh, on the same path that you are, on the same level that you are. Amen. A peer that can encourage you. So Paul had a Barnabas. Not only did Timothy have a Paul, and Paul had a Barnabas, but Paul's need Timothy. Yeah, Paul needs Timothy. Amen. Somebody, when you get to a certain place in your life, can I can I even say this? That whatever level that you're at in your life, you need a Timothy right now. Amen. Because if you're a man of God, you're living for God. There's somebody else that you can pour back into. That's called discipleship. Amen. Somebody that you can pour back into. And what I love about the Pauls that have been in my life, I got Pastor Bobo that's been a Paul in my life. I got Pastor Walker that's been a Paul in my life. I have my dad that has. Been been a Paul in my life. And one thing I can say about these great men of God, guess what they do? They listen to me. Come on, Pastor. They, they have gotten to a place that even though they're instructing me and they're pouring into me, they are not great enough or too big that they cannot hear something from me. And that's the same thing Naaman did. He heard from his son. Amen. And you know, you know that you're a Paul. You know that you're a father when you can listen to your sons. I think there's a word in that. Uh, the father you can hear from that son every once in a while. Yes, sir. Amen. Every man needs a Paul. Every man needs a Barnabas. Every man needs a Timothy. Amen. Here we are again at the proverbial Jordan. Y'all give me some time on that. I tried to make this short, but I, I, it's not working out. Amen. <laughs> Here we are again at the proverbial Jordan, yet it seems like he had forgotten about the Jordan. He's there at a place where he has to make a choice. Yeah. But now, it's like he forgot about the Jordan. Y'all see my baby up here? I told her, uh, these grown folk in here, amen, I told her as we was coming out of Grace Bible Church that she was looking so sexy, amen. She pregnant and sexy, amen. Y'all don't have to celebrate, I celebrate. Amen, the like, am I supposed to clap when he says his wife is sexy? No, amen. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 she went to the doctor on last week, I believe it was, and the doctor was telling her that uh, that that baby might come early. J two is ready to come out. He's already facing down. He's wow. facing down. He's in the right position to come out for birth, and it seemed like he might come a little early. And if he if, because the, you want the baby to be face down, amen. You want the baby to be head. Down. You don't want the baby to be head up because if the baby is head up, the labor is going to be longer. Amen. If the baby is head up, the, ba the labor is going to be longer and it's going to cause the mother more pain. If, if the baby is head up, the labor is going to be longer and it's going to cause the mother more pain. <coughs> Amen. Can I, can, I, can I tell you something about this comfort zone? Amen. The reason why uh, you have not gotten what you need in life as a man and you have not gotten to some places that you thought that you were supposed to be at is because your head is up. Your head is up and your labor is becoming more long and it's causing more pain. But if you would put your head down, I can't get a witness in here. If you would put your head down, make some doors that have been closed or open up. I'm trying to tell you, 
that if you want to be a man of integrity, you have to relinquish the comfort zone. You got to humble yourself and let go of the comfort zone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then I suggest to you this is the same thing that Jesus Christ did on the cross. I'm going to read it to you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on one, the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. But don't stop right there, men. When we humble in ourselves, when we relinquish, humbly relinquish the comfort zone, this is what Jesus tried to be our example of, that therefore at the ninth verse, uh, God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Father, all I'm trying to say to you men is the way up is the way down. When we humble ourselves, but God is us. Oh, and I, I felt this morning that the Holy Ghost pressed on my heart to speak into a man's life that has lost some stuff. You, you've lost some stuff in your life, and you're trying to figure out, why am I losing so much stuff? Why am I not in the place that I want to be? I felt the Holy Ghost tell me to tell you on today that it might just be God trying to humble you. Amen. Because when we won't humble ourselves, God will humble us. Amen. But don't get upset. He's just positioning you head down so that he can exalt. I wish I had a man that would pray to God that he loves me enough to intervene and position me in the place that I need to be to succeed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, no, 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 I see you're trapped in the comfort zone. I see you're trapped in the comfort zone, but then I see, lastly, a failure to properly count. <laughs> I see a failure to properly count. In the comfort zone, there is position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the comfort zone, there is position. In the comfort zone uh, are the comforts that come with that position. In the, in the comfort zone, there is uh, the allure of seeming self-reliance. Mm. It feels good, bro. It feels good. When you got your own money. Yeah. I remember coming to America, talked about our king had his own money. Amen. <laughs> it feels good <laughs> to have your own money. It feels good to have a job and not have to ask anybody for anything. The problem with getting into that place where you feel like you got everything going on is that you begin to rely on yourself and not rely on God. Yeah. 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 That, that was, that was uh, some years ago, there was a plane in Texas. There was this pilot that got into this plane and he started the plane and then he got out the plane. And somehow, somehow on this runway, this plane engages itself. This plane goes down the runway and takes off. This plane is in the air for 90 minutes. It's in the 90 minutes, up in the air, 90 minutes. Nobody's on the plane, no pilot, no nothing. This plane is in the air for 90 minutes, and then it does the inevitable. It crashes, and it burns. Wow. Anybody caught me yet? I'm trying to say to a brother on today that if you do it on your own, you might fly for a while. Yeah. <laughs> So you might take off and go for a while. But inevitably, if you try to do it without God, and you try to rely on yourself, you are going to crash and you are going to burn. Unfortunately, most of us will find in life, brothers, that there's not too many people that we can depend on. So, so when we got some people to depend on, we ought to cherish it. Amen. Uh, but most of us have resorted to depending on ourselves. Yes, sir. But can I suggest to you that even you can't depend on yourself? That's right. Because you get tired. You get spin out. I wish I had a brother that would talk about it. That sometimes you don't feel like keeping going. Amen. Don't do like Naaman did and forget to pray.
properly factor, y'all forgot my observation. Don't forget to properly factor a count on the miracles that God has already done in your life, that he has already worked in your life. Naaman somehow forgot, even though the evidence was right in front of him with his baby smooth skin, he did not count, he did not factor in that the same God that healed him from his leprosy was the same God that would stand up for him if he stood up for him. Here's my last point, and I'm out of here. Men of integrity must count on God. Amen. When you can't count on nobody else, you can count on God. You don't have to compromise. You don't have to capitulate. You don't have to bow down. You don't have to justify. You don't have to run. Because if you stand for God, he will stand for you. You can count on God for your marriage. You can count on God for your children. You can count on God for your job. You can count on God for your business. You can count on God for your money. You can count on God for your peace of mind. You can count on God for self-control. You can count on God for your deliverance. I wish a brother would look at another brother and shout to him, you can count on God. Is there anybody here that knows you can count on God? I know this was a message for the men, but maybe a woman in here will be a witness that have found out that when you count on God, He's always a God that will show up. And He's a God that will show up. I'm getting out of here. But y'all got to look at that first verse. And I'm done. Y'all got to look at that first verse. And I'm done. It says, now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because the Lord, through him, the Lord had given him victory. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Naaman was not an Israelite. Naaman was not a believer. But before he even encountered God, yeah. the Lord had been giving him victory yeah. all the time. Can I tell you another reason why you can count on God, my brother? Because every victory that you've experienced in your life, it was the Lord working it in your place. My daddy used to sing a song that he was there all the time. In the midst of my mess, when I wasn't thinking about him, Everything good that happened in my life, it was the Lord. Yes, you can count on God. 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 Touch your neighbor and say you can count on God. I'm finished. The doors of the church are open on today. The doors of the church are open today. I just want you to come to the altar. You don't have to grab any chairs. Anybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. This God that I just got you talking about came in the flesh as Jesus Christ. This one that you can count on. You need somebody to depend on. You need somebody that you can count on. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you ought to make a commitment to him on today. Because everything that has happened good in your life, it was him being committed to you when you weren't even committed to him. This is the type of God we serve. John 3.16 says it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You mean to tell me he died for you even if you have not confessed him as your Lord and Savior? Even if you don't believe in him? He works in our lives even when we don't pay attention to him. Maybe there's somebody else here on today that you already know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior but you don't have a church home. I want to encourage you to join today. Get connected to the body of Christ. Because you are a believer, you are a part of the body of Christ. You may be a hand, you may be a foot, you may be a leg, you may be an eye, you may be an ear. But only, only, y'all, only you can only succeed in walking the call of God as anointing and blessed for your life when you are connected to the body. Otherwise, you are a limb out there by yourself. I want to encourage you to join Up Fellow Love Christian Church. While you're making a decision, I want to pray for these men in this house. Hallelujah. I want to pray for all the men. I'm going to take out time and pray for all the men all month. 
Amen. Sometimes I don't think that we spend enough time praying for our men, these fathers and these husbands, these brothers and these sons that need support. And what would happen if our men stood up as men of integrity? Uh, this will make our church turn around. This will make our city turn around. This will make our country turn around. So then, if you don't mind, I just want you to come to the altar on today. And as the message preached to our heart that we should be men of integrity, I want to speak it over you. Amen. That we come together. And I just ask the women of the house that you will pray along with me as we worship and we pray for the strength of these men. Some of them are your husbands. You need to be praying real hard. Hallelujah. God is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He's a promise. He's light in the darkness. My brothers. Hallelujah. Come on, say that. Way maker. 